I'd like to invite you to turn with me this morning to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. If you have it, say amen. amen. Here's what it says. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took on him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. What powerful words, perhaps the most powerful verses about what happened in that transition that Jesus made from the heavenly courts, the adored adoration of all the angels to this earth, born in a donkey's food box. How he went lower and lower until there was not a lower place where he could go on our behalf. The incarnation, we're talking about that this morning. God becoming a man, born in a manger. A unique, a unique picture of who the Lord Jesus really is. And what his character of love is like. And what he accomplished all the way to the cross. First of all, long before the cross... Jesus is the creator God. We all know that, don't we, and recognize that. Jesus is the creator God. He uh, had in himself life, original, unborrowed, underived. He is the God of the Old Testament. Amen. Whenever we pose the gospel to people, it's important even incumbent for us to make sure that we introduce Jesus Christ not only as the Savior of the world, gospel here, right? Savior of the world. Not only that, but also that he's the creator of the world, indeed the creator of the universe, both. So uh, Jesus is God. Where would we be today if he were not these? This idea sets the stage for the last warning message in the Bible. I would like to have you turn with me to Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. This is the message just before Jesus comes that is to be carried to the world with great power so all the world can hear. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Notice how we're going to read some passages here this morning that present Jesus not only as the Savior, the Gospel, the God-man, but also as the Creator. These two ideas are closely related in the scripture, that he's both the Savior and he's the Creator. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. I never tire of reading this. And I saw another angel. By the way, who is this angel? <laughs> angel simply means messenger. This involves everybody that accepts Jesus as Savior, right? The Spirit says, come. Let the bride say, come, right? Let him that hears come. So it says here, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. That's the message for the end time. Just a few verses down, it says it, it's a, there's a description of the second coming of Jesus with, a, with a, a sickle in his hand, ready to reap the earth. This is the message that prepares people for the second coming. And uh, <clears throat> we need to read that passage often. See it here. First of all, it talks about the everlasting gospel. Jesus as what? Savior. Jesus as Savior. And then it talks about worship him who did what? Heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. In that one passage, it describes who Jesus is. He's the Savior of the world, and he's the creator of everything. Everlasting gospel translates to Savior. And uh, made heaven, earth, and sea translates to creator. The gospel of John. 
the last gospel written, perhaps written in the, in the um, middle 90s AD. This uh, <clears throat> gospel of John answers a great need that came to light in the, near the close of the first century. A new generation had, been, had arisen who had not seen Jesus. Teachings arose among this new generation of believers, and many of them were questioning the eternal deity of Jesus. Eternal deity of Jesus. That's a mouthful, isn't it? That means he's always been there, and he's God. He's very God. And John, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, began to begins his gospel with these words. Let's look, let's look at let's look at it. Let's just wash our wash. Our, you know, Paul Harvey used to say, "Let's wash our ears out with this." Let's do this. It's John one one to three, and fourteen. John one one to three and fourteen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And who is this being? Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's Jesus, creator of everything, and he's our Savior, and he's very God. He's the God of heaven. Verily, he was God and created everything. Verily, he was a man, our Savior, made in our own flesh and blood. Let's look at another passage. It's Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. Hebrews chapter 4, near the end of the Bible, not far from Revelation. I'd like to have you see it. There's a lot of Bibles and pages turning, so I'm going to wait just a little bit. Hebrews chapter 2, 16 to 18. It says... <clears throat> Well, let me, let me start with verse 16, 16 to 18. For verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in how many things? All, All things it behooved him to be made, like, made, to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the world, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. What an idea. That's Jesus. These are powerful ideas. They're repeated again and again through the scriptures. And we, living down the road of history, uh, 2,000 years since these words are written, almost 2,000 years, uh, we need the same revelation that John gave in this generation, there are so many people don't know who Jesus is, nor what he's doing. Many around us don't know who Jesus is and who he was. It's interesting that the New Testament writers carry the charge that Jesus is both Savior and Creator again and again. Let's look at another one. Uh, this one is Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1, verses 14 to 17. Notice the idea is expressed in this little passage, this short passage, that he is both Savior and Creator. Verse 14. Colossians 1, 14 to 17. In whom we have redemption. Who is that? That's Jesus. Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him are all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether, it be th whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That's Jesus, creator, redeemer. 
And Hebrews 1, chapters 1, 2, and 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. Hebrews 1, over to a few pages to the right. Hebrews chapter 1, 1 to 3. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. Say amen if you have it. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in the time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, there is a Savior, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So he's presented to us as God, right? And Savior, both. God and Savior. What about the Old Testament? It's equally clear. Job, living just a few years after the, after the great flood of Noah, I don't know how many years, maybe a couple hundred years down the road from the flood. Job knew about the Creator. He said, I, or he knew about the Savior. He said, for I know that my, what? Redeemer lives. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh will I see God. Savior, I know that my Redeemer lives. But that same Job also had heard this. He said, and God also asked Job, where were you, way, where were you when the foundations of the earth were laid? <laughs> so in Job, we find the same idea, creator and savior. Isn't that wonderful? And the prophet Isaiah. I want to, you know, we had our scripture reading this morning. Wonderful words from Isaiah. Uh, I just love that. Uh, let's read from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40. I have four little passages here. Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33. And verse uh, 22. It says, For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. And he will do what? Save us. Save us. Who is that? That's Jesus the Savior, right? Let's look at another one. Isaiah 40, verses 26 and 28. Isaiah 40, over to the right a little bit. <clears throat> Isaiah 40, 26 and 28. It says, <clears throat> lift up your eyes on high. This was from our scripture reading this morning. And behold, who has created these things that brings out their host by number? He calls them by all, all by the names of all by names, by the greatness of his might, and that he is strong in power, not one fails. What does this uh, passage speak of? Jesus as creator, right? And verse 28, have you not known, have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. The great creator God is the one that we know as Jesus Christ. Let's look at another one. Isaiah 41, verse 14. It says, Fear not, you worm Jacob, and you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer. There's the gospel. There's Jesus as our Savior. Creator and Savior. You find this all through the scriptures, Old and New Testament. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Another one from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 43. To the right just a little bit. Isaiah chapter 43, 1, 3, and 7. And now this says the Lord that created you, O Jacob, and he that formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. There it is in one verse, Savior and Creator. I have called you by your name. You are mine. And verse 3, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, there it is. If you want to know who the God of the Old Testament is, the Creator is, He's also your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom and Ethiopia and Seba for you. And um, 11 and 25 and 26. 11 says, 
I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no what? Savior. In verses 25 and 26, I, even I, am he that blots out your transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember your sins, Savior. And 26, put me in remembrance. Let us plead together, declare you that you may be justified. Justified, Old Testament idea as well. So, uh, Paul said in our opening text that Christ did not have to consider it robbery to be equal with God. What an idea. Carefully chosen words here by the Apostle Paul. What does all this mean? These word choices reflect careful connections and unity of the, of the triune God, the triune nature of our God, the triune God. If we don't have a good concept and foundation about who Jesus is as God, then we don't have a good concept of what the triune God is like. Colossians 2 verse 9 says, For in him, talking about Jesus, is all the, is, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Godhead is a word used, I think it's three times in the New Testament, which refers to this triune God. And it says, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is a part of the Godhead. In Genesis 1.26, we have the account, let us make man in what? Our image. Indicating, and that's plural, in every translation that I've seen. In our image. After our likeness. And when Jesus told the disciples, I and my father are one. He's most certainly speaking of the equality that he has with his father. In our first text this, this afternoon or this morning, uh, Philippians two six, it says that he was in the very form of God, the very form of God, and that in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus is God. These unusual selections of words analyze for us the reality of the equality that Jesus has in the Godhead. He is surely the God Man. Never ever a being like Jesus Christ. Not a being like this ever in the history of the universe. Jesus took on him at the incarnation a, 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 um, a, an existence that he ever, never, ever knew before. He took on an existence he didn't know before. This makes Christianity unique from all the religions of the world. And we know he lives because there's an empty tomb over there in Palestine. We should have no misgivings about the eternal deity of Christ, the creator. Peter says, we were eyewitnesses to these things. And uh, certainly he was. He was with Jesus for three and a half years. Peter says that. There's no disunity in the Godhead. I'd like to read from 1 John 5 verse 7. 1 John 5, verse 7. <clears throat> That's a little book near Revelation, right close to Revelation. 1 John 5, verse 7. Different translations uh, quote this a little bit differently. But here it is, here's how it is in the old King James Version. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father... The Word, we know who the Word is, don't we? We studied about that in John 1. Three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are what? One. one. There's a unity, a oneness in the Godhead. Uh, love is best expressed in three. But I don't have time, Steve, to talk about that this morning. <laughs> but uh, sometime we'll talk about that. Love is best expressed in three. If there was only one, how could you, where would there be love if that was the only one in the universe? Love needs at least two. But three even makes it more pristine. Sometime we'll, we'll discuss that. So, uh, they are one in bond of love that breathes love to each one of us every day.
If we say God is good, somebody comes along and says, well, God is good all the time, right? And he is good all the time. He loves all the time. You know what? He likes all of you. No more than that, he loves you with an everlasting love. Someone might read John 3.16. That's one of the best known books, uh, verses in all the scripture, right? Someone read that. And come away with an idea foreign to the clear verses that we've been reading. Let's read it. John chapter 3, verse 16. And it's important here to read all the words. John chapter 3, verse 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Everybody knows this verse. I think most people here can probably quote it. But I don't want to leave out any words. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. So when we consider this expression, only begotten Son, this, is, this has challenged Bible students down through the centuries, actually. In the, thir- in, the third, in, the, um, in the fourth century, that would be in the 300s, there were over 45 church councils trying to figure this one out. What does it mean, only begotten son? There have been some questions. Some have insisted that bearing a title like that, only begotten son, that Jesus must have a, had a point of beginning. But we've been reading texts about that. It's not what the clear texts say, right? He didn't have a beginning. He's the eternal God who inhabits eternity. Some say, have said, well, that he could not have eternity. He could not have eternally existed alongside with the Father God, whose Son he is. Can that be? Is that what the Bible teaches? Our normal understanding is that begotten means to be birthed, right? Born. Birthed. That's what we normally think. And this suggests to us a point of what? Origin. I want you to follow along with me now. This suggests a point of origin. That in that using this line of reasoning, Jesus was somehow inferior to the Father, maybe a lesser God than the Father is. I'll have to tell you, this is very fuzzy thinking when you take the Bible as a whole. What do we do when we find an unclear text in the Bible? Do we just start making stuff up? That's been done too much. What we need to do when we find an unclear text in the Bible is to go to all the clear texts and then interpret that text that's unclear to us by the clear ones. So uh, we need to be careful that we don't just make things up, as many have done. We must let the clear texts interpret the unclear ones. Let's reason about this a little bit. First of all, being begotten does not always mean being birthed. As we might reason from our common experience of being born. We were all born, right? We all had a mother and a father at some point. And we, were, and we have all been birthed. Did you know that the Bible says that the nation of Israel was begotten? Let's read about it. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And let's read verses uh, 3 to 6. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 to 6. All I'm trying to do this morning is to show that Jesus is God. He's the very God. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 to 6. You know, this is the very center of the gospel. If Jesus isn't God then we are, of most people, most miserable. In fact, we're just wasting our time here this morning because we don't really have a Savior. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 to 6. Here's what it says. He is the rock. And in my Bible, it's a capital R. Is that right? Talking about God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are judgment, a God of truth. And without iniquity, just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children, 
They are a perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he your what? Father, that has, brought, that has bought you, has he not made you and established you? So he's chiding his people Israel here. They were fathered by God, but they were not living the life of loyal children, were they? They were worshiping idols. They had changed gods in the middle of the stream. Let's go down to verses 17 and 18. They sacrificed to devils, not to God, of, not, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, and, and to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of, that, of the rock that fathered you, you are unmindful and have forgotten the God that formed you. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and his daughters. They were sons and daughters, and they were begotten, right? Usually we think sonship as being birthed, but notice something, notice something going on here in the genealogy in Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Time is passing so quickly, I might have to finish this another time. Luke chapter 3, 23, 24, it says, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, which was the son of Methot, which was the son of Levi, which was the son of Melchi, which was the son of Janna, which was the son of Joseph. Now, we're not going to read all that list. But this is the genealogy. It goes back to Adam. Notice in verse 38. Which was the son of Enos. Which was the son of Seth. Which was the son of Adam. Which was what? The son of God. Jesus, uh, Adam, our first father, wasn't birthed, was he? He was created. He was declared to be God's son on the basis of, of this genealogy. Adam was God's son, but he was not birthed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'd like to have you look at this with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, verses 44 and 47. 1 Corinthians 15. You know, I'm in the middle of it here. I can't stop. Can I go on a little bit longer? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 45. This is a powerful chapter. I would encourage you, it might be a good Sabbath afternoon to read, actually. It says in verse 45, so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, a living spirit. Now, this first man, Adam, was made. And yet he's called God's what? God's son. God's son. But when we go down to verse 47, it talks about the other Adam. You know, there are two Adams. The first Adam, who is our, our father, right? By the law of fatherhood, he's our father. If anybody here would doubt that, ask yourself the question, where would we be this morning if Eve if Adam had died before Eve conceived her first son. I'll say that again. Where would we be this morning if Eve, if uh, Adam had died before Eve conceived her first son? Would anybody, any of us be here? No. We were all in Adam. We were all in that first Adam, right? Like the oak trees in the acorn, we were all in him. But notice verse, verse 47. The first man is of the earth, earthly, the second man is what? The Lord from heaven. <laughs> he's God, right? That's the second Adam. He's, he's the Lord from heaven. Uh, the first Adam was made, created as a son, and the second Adam is the Lord of heaven. So God came here, and in language that we can understand, 
I can understand father and son. Can you all understand that? (laughs) We've all been there, haven't we? Language that we can understand. Jesus became the son of the father in heaven. By contrast, the father and son, these roles were by covenant. You can read about this in Zechariah, the sixth chapter where it says that they made a covenant between the both of them. Jesus would come to this world and become our Savior, and the Father would remain in heaven in this father-son relationship that we can all understand very well. Father-son's relationships, so we can understand God's love. The bond that comes in a normal father-son relationship. What an arrangement. Hebrews 10, 5. Let's look at it. Hebrews 10, verse 5. Hebrews 10, verse 5. These are things we talk about in a Bible study. We're getting into heavy things here with with the Sabbath sermon. But notice it. Hebrews 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you would not but a body you have prepared me. Now in Luke, it talks about the Holy Spirit planting a seed, a body in the womb of Mary, right? It came by virgin birth. It didn't come in a natural way. And so, I'd like to refer you now to Luke chapter one. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. That's an easy one to find. Luke 1, verse 35. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called what? The Son of God. What is the tense in this verse? You will find this remains true throughout the scripture. The tense is either present or future. He shall be called what? The Son of God. He will be called that. Uh, This father-son relationship is not about the origins of the Godhead. It's about the origins of the plan of salvation. By covenant. Who was to inhabit that body? Let's turn back a few pages to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1. Matthew 1 verses 21 and 23. Matthew 1, 21 and 23. I want us to all see this. And she shall bring forth a son... And you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And now verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child. She shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is what? God with us. This was God in the, in, in, in the incarnation in the womb of Mary. Is that right? God himself, who created worlds, came here to become the son of the father. He shall be called the son of God. And all the while the father in heaven would be his confidant, the one in whom the son would put all of his trust. The one to whom he would be infinitely obedient to the father. He always knew the father was there. Notice how he prays. John 17, notice how he prays. John 17, verses 4 and 5. John 17, 4 and 5. This is a famous prayer of Jesus, just right off, almost in the shadow of the cross. Chapter 17, 4 and 5. I have glorified you on the earth. Notice he's praying to his Father. I have glorified you in the earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with your own self, And with the glory, which, what does it say next? Which I had with you before the world was. Okay. He came here to be the son of the father. 
to show us what love was ex expressed in all of this. This is how we can relate also to Jesus like Jesus related to his father. He can, we can relate to him as our savior like he related to the father. And the Holy Spirit works miracles in our lives too, just like he did in the life of Jesus. Actually, as the second item, God's son, Jesus starts a family tree, a new family tree. We were all born in that first Adam, right? And that first Adam uh, caused some trouble in the family tree, right? We're all sinners as a result of that. But notice, we can be born again of the Spirit into that new family. Did you know that in the Old Testament, Jesus is called the Everlasting Father? It's in Isaiah 9, verse 6. We won't take the time to turn there. But he's called Wonderful. That's his name, right? In that verse, Isaiah 9, 6, he's also called the Everlasting Father. We have a new father. What God did in this transaction is give us a whole new start, right? In Adam, the first Adam, we have a, a history that's filled with evil, right? Rebellion, disbelief in God's word. But Jesus came here as the second Adam. The father of a new human race of people who are, who are connected as children of Abraham by faith. We can read about that in Galatians chapter 3, the last verses. I would like to have you look at Romans 1, 1 to 4. Romans 1, 1 to 4. This adds greatly to our understanding of what we've just been studying. Romans 1, 1 to 4. We all have it? Romans 1, 1 to 4, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. And what does the next word say? And what? Declared to be the son of God, with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. You know, we could refer to Christ coming here as the Christ event. He was born here, right? One of us. He lived a perfect life on our behalf. He was always obedient to the Father. That's why he can give us a new history, because we can be found in him, in this new family line. And uh, then he died, he resurrected, and ascended back to heaven. So uh, he has made for us a new history. We had an old history. And that history is what we're born with. The Bible says that we go forth as soon as we're born speaking what? Lies. We're sinners from the beginning. But he came here and provided us with a new history. What an idea. He came down here as a savior. And the purpose of all this, you can find it in Hebrews 2, verse 10, to bring many sons to glory. Many sons to glory. We can all be his sons and daughters. He came here to bring many sons to glory. That's to me, that is the most powerful idea that I could ever think about or, or dream about. So being born into that new family is the passion of our study today. Galatians 3, verse 27, and we're going to have a baptism in a few minutes. Galatians 3, verse 27. I'd like to have you look at this with me. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. It says, for as many of you. Oh, wait, I see the page is still rustling. Galatians 3, 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have done what? Put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. You are all one in what? Christ Jesus. You're part of that holy history, a history that is spotless. And in justification, we can all claim that. God looks at us as though we had never sinned when we give our hearts to him in a meaningful way. Isn't that encouraging? And then more than anything else in this world, 
We want to be what he says we already are in him. There's the motivation for living a godly life for sanctification. He gives us a motive. And it's just wonderful. So that's the gospel. Uh, He hasn't changed his mind. He had an eternal purpose for Adam and Eve, our first parents. And... uh, but he didn't throw us away. He promised He promised to uh, give us a new family history with a new father, the federal head of the human family. And if we so choose, we can be a part of that family. And Marjorie's going to do that today. It's a sign of what she's already done. It's simply a sign or a symbol of a decision that she's made to give herself to Jesus in a powerful way. Today, a baptism into the family of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What a family. (laughs) We're all family here this morning. The family in heaven and the family on earth are one. And when Jesus comes, we'll be physically united to that heavenly family. I can't think of a higher, higher idea or ideal to even talk about. Baptism, a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Before we have a baptism, I want to read one more text. It's Romans chapter 2. <laughs> Romans chapter 2. This is, uh, I'm sorry, it's not Romans chapter 2. It's Romans chapter 6, starting with verse 2. Wayne, I did that too today. Did you see that just then? <laughs> Romans 6, starting with verse, let's start with verse 3 instead of 2. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him Death always comes before life, doesn't it? When you plant a kernel of of corn in the ground, the seed dies and there's a new life. First the blade, then the ear, and then full corn in the ear, right? Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That's past tense. When Jesus was here, our old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed, hereafter we should not serve sin.